Well, hello and welcome to the Switch It Show here on ESPNCrickInfo.com. I'm Jonathan harris Bash. Joining me today, I'm delighted to welcome Jared Kimber, Andrew Nashim McGlashan, and Alex Winter. The final test of the English Ashes summer is upon us with the series in the bag. England have named a few changes in their squad for the Oval match, topping the bill as far as perhaps surprises are concerned. Simon Kerrigan, the Lancashire left armour, who, as Peter Moores, his county coach, has stated, is in the 14 on merit, not due to the high-profile meltdown of Monty Panesar. I'm not sure. I just wonder, I mean, is that just what Moores has to say as his coach, or do you think that, that that's the truth? If, Mon if Monty had been in the right frame of mind and bowling well, he'd have been in the England squad. He was in the squad two tests ago, so that wouldn't have changed if if the instance of the last couple of weeks hadn't occurred. So um, that isn't to say Kerrigan isn't worthy of his chance. It's a good opportunity for England to look at some of these players who may feature in the return season in Australia. It's always good to assess, assess the depth you have. And I guess when you're looking at the spinners, it's sometimes a bit of a... A, a different situation because you invariably, from England's point of view, you only have one front liner in the team, um, except when you really go to some content. You don't really know who's who's at that level below, so it's a good opportunity to have a look at Kerrigan in training. And look, if it looks like a raging Bunsen on the as, as, as they as they toss up on on a Wednesday morning, he may yet play. I think it's extremely unlikely given the balance of the teams that England tend to pick at home. But he's got a chance to impress Andy Flower. And ask the cook, and if if things don't take an upturn for Monty over the next few months, then um, I suspect he'll be on the plane to Australia as well. So probably the, the, the great likelihood here, Alex, is that, that they're just going to take a look at how he, he fits in at the squad. Then, yeah, it seems to be that way. They're just sort of getting a few guys together. That, as Nasha says, they've probably got an eye on for uh, for Australia. They tend to take one or two to sort of blood them on tours. Uh, down under, so uh, Kerrigan slots nicely into that category. Have you had a haircut, Alex? You're looking about 12 years younger. You almost look your age for once. <laughs> you mean he looks 12? <laughs> exactly. No one ever know whether you have a haircut or not, Jared, because you always wear that infernal baseball cap. Well, not infernal, um, different baseball caps, so I don't know whether, when last time you had a haircut was. Um, but as far as Australia are concerned with Kerrigan, getting back to the point in hand, Jared, do you think that he's going to fill them with any fear? I mean, he received a bit of tap from Shane Watson. Uh, I don't think he'll play, so I don't think they're really planning to play him that much. Um, I mean, England have just been bringing random people into the squad just to have a look at them and uh, groom them occasionally, and uh, they do a lot of network. I think Wokes was at the last test, from memory. Uh, everyone's been there. Very few have played, so I'd be very surprised if he's played. But I think he's a good bowler. I think that in some ways I think he might have been worth a chance earlier than Monty. Um, it's a shame it only came uh, about with Monty sort of having this amazing breakdown. Um, but uh, but I think Kerrigan probably deserved more of a chance uh, early on. They both, they played up fourth week in a T20. Yeah, they, they they took Scott Borthwick and Danny Briggs to India a couple of winters ago, and yeah. that was Kerrigan was still very raw then. That was before he'd helped Lancashire to the championship title. Just thought I'd squeeze that one in there. Um, Lancashire and, won the championship. They, they did two two years ago, and they might win the second it. division this year as second well. Second division. Yeah, second division. Yeah. So um, they won two years ago, and they're in the second division. Yeah. Okay, we'll skim over that <laughs> point. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, like I was saying, it's one of those slightly tricky ones when you're looking at your backup spinners because England don't pick more than one. So the guys on the fringes, the likes of the Kerrigans, I suppose, the, the um, as in Rafiks, the Scott Borthwicks, and people like that, even James Treadwell to a lesser extent, don't really get much time around squads because England don't need them in the squad. So um, whether Kerrigan plays for England over the next 12 months depends on the fitness of Graham Swan. England, I can't see at any point England needing two spinners in Australia. Pitches down there don't turn that much even Sydney these days so um, yeah enough. so um, it probably perhaps won't be for like, Kerrigan's opening in test cricket perhaps won't come until Swan retires um, or they go on the next turn of constant which uh, may actually be after Swan retires anyway and he's only 24 Kerrigan so he does have plenty of time um, Jared just returning to the, the Monty Panesar story latest um, breaking news on that front is that he's been released by Sussex um, and and it is quite a spectacular implosion that's taken place yeah I mean <laughs> it's not it's the sort of thing that happens in cricket all the time I suppose in the old days and things were sort of washed over and you wouldn't really hear the story until someone wrote their blog biography or or there'd be a sportsman's night where you'd hear hear about it. But now it sort of happens, obviously. I suppose when, and I might be wrong here, but when you urinate on people in public um, in, in the modern world, there's always a chance, you know, the media are going to blow it out of proportion. 
Uh, there's also a lot of other stories about him uh, that, that have been going around for a while. It's not as if, I suppose a lot of us had heard little rumours, but you're never quite sure what's true and what's not. But it, it, it is quite sad because like, he's a talented player. Um, but, it, you know, there's only so much cricket clubs can do for these guys. And I know that sports psychiatry or sports psychology used to be about, you know, pushing players as far as they could. And that's why a lot of people broke down. Now it's really about making them well-rounded human beings. And I'm sure that Sussex were trying to do everything that they could to make him just, you know, be okay. And clearly he, his emotional problems and his personal problems are just too much at the moment. And that's going to happen, unfortunately. And it probably happens in accountancy firms as well. Um, it just doesn't make the papers. So he, he just needs a change and hopefully to get some of these things right in his life. Yeah, it happens all over the world, but not everyone wants to capture it on their phone, which is the other thing that I think sort of goes against Monty and this... Although, well, if you were peeing on anyone, I would definitely capture it on my phone. You'd feel on that, wouldn't you? It's, it's true. I mean, and I'd expect it, and I'd expect it to be front-page news, and, and it probably wouldn't be, and I'd be really mortified by that. Um, but, Alex, as far as Monty's future's concerned, released by Sussex, it looks as though he's going to play second division cricket, um, and it's sort of the, the questions being posed, like, is he going to return to North Hans? Is he going to go to Essex? I mean, all of these moves, the pro projected moves for Monty Panesar, will they give him a, a genuine chance of being able to get on the winter tour to Australia? I'd like, I'd like to hope not, really. I hope um, that they go with Kerrigan. He's, he, he's the, the rising star, really, in, in, in the English spin bowling ranks and I, and I hope he, he gets a chance to, to go on the tour of Australia and uh, even, even if he ends up just playing the tour matches it'll be a great experience for him and set him in step of the future. Uh, Monty, well, he, he's not getting any younger and his, his bowling's gone backwards, hasn't it? So if, if, if you're just taking it on uh, cricketing merit then uh, there's no real case to say that uh, the Palace has got a chance of making the winter tours unless he finds a new county wherever it is and uh, completely uh, sorts himself out and shows some form the last uh, three, four matches of the season. Do, do you go along with that, Nasha? Do you think that there's, there's very little chance of Monty making the Winter Tour now? Um, I think it's slim, um, but England aren't going to throw away someone as talented as Monty Panasar. Uh, not for the first time, I may slightly disagree with Alex in that Monty's bowling's um, gone backwards. I mean, I won't say he's reinvented his game over the last couple of years, but um, he is a very fine left arm spinner and he's uh, perhaps part of the problem about where Monty is right now is perhaps a feeling of being unappreciated and unloved. I know that sounds a bit cushy and a bit soft and a bit modern and all that, but as sort of as Jared was saying, you, you kind of well, play well, yeah. different players in, in different ways and, and kind of he is, and there was, a, there was a line I read in one of the papers the other day that it's a slightly toned down version of the Shane Warne versus the Australian spinners line in that if, if, if Graeme Swan hadn't, hadn't been around this single team, Monty Panasol would have been being talked about as, as one of England's finest spinners uh, of all time. And, and yes, he's averaging 33 in test cricket, but you, if, you, if you delve down into his stats a little bit more, he has done a lot of very fine service for England. It was only, only eight, nine months ago he was forming a, a historic match series, a series-winning partnership with Graeme Swan. In India, yes, he didn't go so well in New Zealand, but he wasn't alone in that in, in the England team, and there are some suggestions that his problems maybe started on that tour. So it would be careless of English cricket if they did not try and help Monty to resurrect his career. Spinners of, of his ilk, of, of, his, of, his, of his class, um, don't come along all the time. We're talking about Simon Kerrigan as being the next big thing. He might well be. He's also very young. Even Peter Moores yesterday admitted that he's... Um, He's got work to do on learning his game as a spinner about when to attack and, uh, and when to defend. And the international game isn't really when you, where you want to be learning that. We've seen the danger of throwing spinners in too early with Australia a few times over the last few years. So Simon Kerrigan might be absolutely ready. He might take international cricket by storm. But let's not let's not let Monty Panasar's career just wither away in second division county cricket if it can at all be helped. Where Lancashire are? Uh, for a few more weeks, Jared. Yes. And then next year they'll be back for a season. Um, so <laughs> that's quite all right. Um, as far as the rest of the, the England squad and the announcements that have been made um, in the inclusion uh, ahead of this fifth test match, there there is a, definitely a feeling of them, them looking after players, Chris Tremlett being a fine example of this. And it looks at the moment 
uh, Jared, as though he's going to be the one change, uh, well, the one guaranteed change that England make to their lineup. Yeah, I'm, I don't know. I, I suppose that makes sense, but I'm not 100% sure they've made their mind up. But I, I think that they, before taking him to Australia, they should have a good look at him. I haven't seen enough of him at county level. I know George has seen a little bit. I've talked to some other people who have seen a little bit. No one's talking about him being brutal. Um, I did talk to one player who faced him this season, and he said, I think uh, I think he's massively overrated if that's the best he's got. So I think um, I think that player had just faced him this season and maybe not as much in, in previous years. And so if that's the case, then he's not really being feared. Watch him in the um, the T20, the first finals day game, and he didn't look like the Chris Tremlett that makes you you know want to lock yourself up in your closet um, and never come out. So uh, maybe if you're Maybe it's worth just playing him just to see if he is ready for Australia. But uh, he may not ever be the Chris Tremlett of, of that, what, five or six tests, really. Yeah. Um, it, we only ever saw him right at his best for that little while, so he might not come back to that. He might not come back to it. Alex, I mean, there are lots of people suggesting that he should play in this test match because it's his home ground. Um, but hasn't been at Surrey that long, and I just wonder whether it's, whether it's that advantageous in playing at the Oval. Well, I, I just think England like him, don't they? They've done everything they can to get him back involved. Obviously, he's got the history against Australia in that uh, in that last Ashes tour, and, and and they're very very keen to get a, a tall, big, fast bowler back in the side. And uh, I don't think they trust Stephen enough at the minute. Um, he, had, he had a very poor showing at uh, at Trent Bridge. He, he was immediately sort of sent back to Middlesex, and uh, Bresden was brought in, and so whether they would go back to Finn when all the sort of leanings have been towards getting Chris Tremlett back involved and now he's got a chance to play on his home ground, even though he hasn't been there for long, but uh, I think this is the perfect chance to uh, to get Tremlett back out there. I mean, Nasha and Jared, on this point of the sort of the Finn versus Tremlett line, Jared, you're, you're talking there about the fact that we've got Tremlett and they probably need to have a look at him and, and see where he's at. Would the fear of playing Finn here, that if someone like Brad Hadding got after him again, be that his confidence would be completely shot ahead of um, the, the tour down in Australia? But doesn't that need to be found out before they pick the squad down to Australia? Because if they're going to go after Finn, then he doesn't have a place to, to play in the Ashes. I think Finn's a pretty confident guy. I think you need to smash him a lot um, to really dent his confidence. So I don't think it's <clears throat> a confidence thing. I don't think he fits the game plan, though. Um, and that's what happens over and over. And I don't think David Saker is ever 100% bought in to Stephen Finn. And there's a lot of talk, too, that David Saker has tried to change Finn. And Finn's, I mean, for a cricketer, a basketballer, is a bit more intelligent. And he's got his own views. And he doesn't always... The other guys sort of just hear what Saker says and, and take it on board and use it. Sounds like Finn takes it from there, from, from Middlesex and from Saker, and that there's this weird clash of... I think Finn has challenged Saker a little bit yeah. more than perhaps some of, of the other bowlers. Also, we've got to remember that what Saker's been doing with Finn has also been some quite fundamental changes. This is changing a guy's run-up. I mean, it's second only to changing his actual bowling action, really. They are the two fundamental parts for a fast bowler. You only have to go back to look at what England almost ruined James Anderson by trying to change his his delivery action all, all those years ago, he's obviously come out the other side um, a, a fine bowler but because he's gone back to what he's trusted. Now, Finn has gone back to the long run. Um, Angus Fraser has gone on record as saying he prefers that longer run. David Saker sounds a bit more kind of either way about it, but um, he thought it gave Finn more control of the crease. Finn didn't feel comfortable. Ultimately, the guy bowled, trying to bowl that ball at 90 miles an hour has to be the one that feels comfortable about what he's trying to do. Um Again, a bit like I was mentioning, that maybe international cricket's not the place for Kerrigan to learn his trade. It's not ideal to have to be doing these things in international cricket. So that's, a, that's one of the reasons why they've sent Finn back these last few weeks to Middlesex. Um, the results have not been starving, but maybe something has clicked. Maybe they've seen something. Um, well, the problem with him going back to Middlesex so, is essentially what he has to do for England is dry up the runs. Yeah. And when you're that quick a bowler and you go back to county cricket, you can't help but yeah. try and knock people's but heads he's off. He's a strike bowler yeah. for Middlesex. Interesting, what was interesting when he did go back, though, he wasn't given the new ball, and he said that was an agreement between um, all parties. Now, he's not, I know he took the new ball at Trent Bridge, that's because Broad was injured, he's not first choice new ball for England, so maybe there is a bit of collaboration about exactly what they're trying to get out of Finn, and they are, perhaps they are trying to mould him into this slightly more economical bowl. I think that's dangerous, I think when you've got a guy who's averaging 
mid twenties in Test cricket with a good strike rate as Finn has. Let's not forget this guy's almost taken a hundred Test wickets. He's not a, he's not been a failure at Test cricket by any means. He's just had a few problems. But I think what this also says is we should not um, underestimate the loss of Tim Bresnan to, to to this England side. As Jared talking about plans and fitting the mould, he is exactly the man yeah. that England wanted in that in that third seamer role, and he did his job perfectly. And regardless of success, we've seen England before get rid of Compton even after he'd been successful yeah. because they, they didn't do yeah. what they want. He didn't fit what they were looking for at that time. They, so. they have plans, they have diagrams, they have wall charts, they have DVDs, they have everything that shows them what they want Admit to it, do. You'd love to make wall charts. Uh, yeah. Oh, like, dream job. Um, but um, yeah, so um, if someone doesn't quite understand fit into that mould, especially um, when perhaps the team isn't clicking perfectly as it hasn't this summer, um, that gets them a little bit uneasy. So I, I'd be amazed if Stephen Finn doesn't go to Australia. I, I'd be amazed if he's still not one of the six best fast bowlers in England. I think the one to look at on the blind side, and maybe if Tremlett shows he's not quite up to test cricket anymore, then Boyd Rankin is the one I think coming up on the blind side. Again, Saker loves this tall quick bowlers. Um, anyone under 6'5 is probably struggling to get a, a test match for England if they're not yet capped. So um, I guess Graham Munyon is the prime example of that and bad timing for his thumb injury this week as well. So um, yeah, I, I, I'd be surprised having taken Trevor around the country if he isn't the one played um, this week. Um, but I, I agree with Jared. I'm not sure we're ever going to see the Trevor of, of a couple of years ago again. Any chance, Jared, that you think England might completely go against the grain of what they've done for the last um, five years and, and pick five, a five-bowling attack with, with two spinners and three seamers? Or is that just um, just fant fantastical thought process from me? Well, it sounds like you're, you're running a science fiction novel that Andy Flower would disagree on. <laughs> like Andy Flower doesn't even believe in science fiction. He believes in science and hard science, and that's it. So, no, I, I can't imagine they would do that. It'd be fun, though, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be fun if teams just did wacky things again? James Faulkner to bat three for Australia. Matthew Wade to play as a specialist batsman. <laughs> well, all of these things would be fantastic. But Alex, I mean, with the, Chris Wokes is back in the squad. I mean, could fulfil a sort of a, a, an all-rounder role, even though the Australians don't especially rate him as a bowler. Um, do you think... But that he's not, I mean, he's obviously in the plans um, by being involved in the squad, but he's not got a chance of playing. Well, he will be the like, the like spot, really, with, with Tim Bresnan, but um, whether he's shown enough form in, in, in county cricket this season is debatable. He's, he's got 27 wickets at, uh, at 22, which, which, which is a reasonable return, I suppose. And uh, you remember that off the top of your head, or were you reading that in front of you? I'd written it down. I've yeah, written it down. I've got my stats prepared, but um, yeah, yeah. Wokes is a guy that, that England have brought in and around their squads before. Uh, many people have said that it's with the red ball where he is strongest, and um, and perhaps a push in, in, into Test cricket would, would suit him better on the international stage as opposed to the chance he he's had in one day cricket that uh, haven't exactly gone according to plan. Ultimately, though, we, we all uh, appear to be pretty much agreed that as this is not science fiction, England are going to make one change from their starting 11 at Chester Street, and that was an enforced change because um, Tim Bresnan's not fit. I mean, there's no chance they're going to do anything else, Nash and Jared, or I mean, I, I, once again, am I going down the, the Isaac Asimov route of England selection? Are we trying to stretch this out even longer? I think I think we're basically saying that England are going to do the obvious thing and bring Chris Tremlett back, which now means they're probably not. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, Tremlett for Bresden, I'd be surprised if it was anything else. So Philip K. Dix, just ask normal cricket questions now. I know. I won't ask. I won't ask the same question for a fourth time. Let's move on to Australia. Um, and uh, as far as their selection issues are concerned, once again, I, I don't know. They appear to me to be to be making a bit of a mountain for themselves when when perhaps they should have just stuck with with the selection of, of the previous Test match where they they played pretty well. Um, I suppose at this stage they're trying to work out the next series as well, aren't they? So. Um... I, they probably are interested in Faulkner. Usman Khawaja, they know now is not good enough. Um, and they're probably just taking a couple of punts to see what happens. Um, I think that it's a bit ridiculous at this stage that Mitchell Stark keeps coming in and out of the side and Faulkner hasn't had a go. He's been one of the best shield bowlers around. He was the man of the match in the shield final for the bat and ball. 
Um, I mean, he's a bit, he's, he's an unreconstructed bowler. There's not much to him. He just sort of puts it in the right area. But he's a bit like Bresden, I suppose, in that he, he can move it around a little bit and he's always at you. And he's very aggressive. He took on Chris Gale in the big bash um, more than once, I think. Um, so it's probably worth talking about him. And then Waze is someone who averages 35 with the bat in test cricket. Now, it's not a great average, but when you look at the other Australian averages, uh, he's a batsman. And he also bought some handy medium pace. He's quicker so, than you think. Well, yeah. I was having this conversation with Bright um, the other day because Darren Lehman had suggested he didn't end up doing it, but that Matthew Wade may have been needed in the uh, two-day game against England Lions because Australia only picked the two front line quick start in Faulkner for that game. And there was a semi-serious discussion about the value of of Wade's medium pace, so he, when he bowled it over against Sri Lanka, he hit 130k or something. He I think did. doing it and uh, got got some bounce. So who knows? Maybe Matthew Wade is the secret all round option that they're about to unleash um, on England for the next six Ashes Tests. Well, was anything learned from that Lions match, Jared? As far as Australia were concerned, I think the most important thing was Usman Khawaja well, didn't bat at three and Phil Hughes did. I think um, everything else. I mean, whether it, uh, they, they go with Phil Hughes or they even, uh, pick Eddie Cowan or even Matthew Wade or just change the order randomly, I think I would be very surprised if Usman Glodge comes out at number three in the next set for Australia. Um, Bryden wrote a very good piece. It was interesting that day. We both, we, you know, we, before we knew the test match was going to finish, uh, we turned to each other and um, Bryden said to me, do you know what Looked I want to write about? Eyes. We looked at each other's eyes and Bryden's like, I want to talk about the number three for Australia. And I said, I just, I just told George I want to write about that. So it's clearly an issue and I think that, I think Usman Khawaja, re regardless of whether he's an experiment as an Asian, as Shield Berry might have accidentally put it, uh, or as a number three, I just don't think he's an in international batsman at the moment. I, it's not, he's got a lot of time to play the ball, but he's got a couple of technical flaws, but most importantly, I don't think mentally he has, he has the game for it at the moment. Keep putting him in at number three just seems like uh, a waste of his time and Australia's time. To have a number three where the opposition are so confident of getting him out for no more than 20, is, is a very dangerous way to go because even if you have a solid opening stand and there's been a couple of those for Australia recently they've been 80 for none or 100 for none as they were at Durham you get one out and then it becomes 80 for two and you've yeah. suddenly got to start that rebuilding again You're, it, it's, it's a, it adds a vulnerability where actually they've managed to put on some solid opening starts that, and it, that's still being undone by the uh, but by the flakiness of the number three. Well, the perfect example of this was at, at the, in the last test when all the English were saying, there's no way we can win this as you know, Warner and Rogers you know, were, were smashing it everywhere. And I kept saying, Australia's two wickets down once they lose a wicket. That just starts something that, that is very hard to pull back. And that's essentially you know, what happened. I mean, he, he missed a ball that I'm, I'm going to go out there and say that all four of us probably could have hit that ball. It was a very, very tame delivery. You know, uh, it was <laughs> compared to what Swan can do to you. It was pretty a pretty ordinary delivery. And, you know, Alex probably would have chipped it for three, and Nasha would have just defended it, and uh, you and I would have tried to slog it and miss it at the mid-wicket. But I think we all might have been. You know, it wasn't the best ball that Graham Swan's ever bowled, and as a number three, you shouldn't be going out to balls that are that easy to play. Have you just summed up our characters? With three cricket shots. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I, thought, I thought that's what you were doing. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I'd agree with that. Um, but Alex, uh, looking at this Australian side coming into the final test, as Adam Gilchrist has been writing on the site, the, the two the two guys who are emerging with the most credit are Ryan Harris and and, and Chris Rogers, and they're thirty three and thirty five, and, and you think that's quite worrying still. Yeah, it certainly is, and. and sort of regenerates these debates about uh, the strength of Australian domestic cricket and uh, and and the focus for the young players really but I, I think the uh, the best member of the Australian touring party has been the physiotherapist to keep uh, keep these old guys out in the park Ryan Harris in particular has uh, has, has been their best bowler by a long way and and if he manages to play four tests in a row that really would be something well, I think it's um even as Adam Gilchrist pointed out, how important Ryan Harris is to play in, in this test match at the Oval. Um, and also just how different Australia's results may have looked if he had been fit um, over the last few years, but more consistently fit. Anyway, I, I think I also need to point out at this stage, um, I, I hate to shatter anyone's illusions about this show, but, but Alex and, and, and Nasha and Jared are sitting about 15 metres apart, and yet Alex seems to have a connection which puts him in Australia with the lag, 
And uh, and Jared and, and Nasha, you seem to be on a, a very much better connection. So we're progressives, and he's a conservative. Yeah. Well, uh, there we go. Let's not let's not open up that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just like saying Nasha was progressive. <laughs> Yeah. I like saying national progressive. I think that's very good. But I mean, looking at Ryan Harris, I mean, do you think that they're going to be bold and pick him for this Test match, or do you think they'll want to sort of wrap him up in cotton wool and now and, and and not try and tempt fate by getting him pick up an injury here? It's it's a weird decision to not play him. I, I, so many people have said to me they just can't pick him because he might pick up an injury. Uh, the thing with Ryan Harris is he could pick up an injury going to get milk from the shop. So you know there are many different ways that he gets injured. Uh, I it's think it's dangerous that, you know, like crossing those roads. Exactly. Well, I was more thinking of picking up the oh, milk well, that shoulder. Too, yeah, yeah, the old shoulder. Because he likes yeah. the two litre yeah. milk, which, yeah. as you can see, he drinks it whole. Um, and then he drinks the cow. It's quite weird. But it's the sort of man that Ryan Harris is. But I think that, realistically, you've got, wait a minute, two, three, what are we, in August? Mm. September, October. you got about three months here, is that right? Yeah, till the return series starts. Until the next series. I had to count that out. Sorry, I almost needed my fingers. Um, <laughs> Realistically, I think if you if you're really worried about a guy's fitness, uh, you, you can't you can't rest him for a test because there's another test in three months' time. I just think that it just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I would have, I might have rested him during the series, but I wouldn't have rested. I won't rest him now. It's a little bit like why I wouldn't rest wouldn't have rested James Anderson for this last test match. He can he can have the rest of the season off after this test match, um, which gives him another month. Then he can have October off and he can get back to bowling. At the end of October, early November, in those early tour matches, I, I, I think kind of sometimes you these guys are sportsmen. That that's what they're there to do. Um, and I think sometimes you just got to let them go. And if well, yes, look, if, if Ryan Harris or James Anderson picks up an injury at all, the overall, you can imagine the the fury there's going to be. But I, I think you, I don't. You can always be planning for the worst case scenario. No, and um, Australia, well, would dearly love uh, to pick up a victory here um, because, as Jared's favourite watchword, momentum is still up for grabs very much uh, going into the... If they win this next test, they will actually win the next Ashes. It's a fact. It is a fact, isn't it? It's the way momentum works. Yeah, it um, cannot change. However, what I, mean, what I would say is that coming, coming towards the end of this series, but are Australia going to be leaving England after the test cricket? I'm too depressed. They've, they've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with England in two of the test matches that they've lost, yes, but and then they were in a very good position at Old Trafford. It was only at Lords where they, they probably disgraced themselves. And uh, I, I just think, I don't know, I, I would have thought that at the moment, Alex, uh, Australia are going to be leaving England in, well, in relatively high spirits. No, John, the 3-0 down. If they lose 4-0, they'll be back on the plane feeling as down the dumps as any Australian side to ever have left the British Isles. And do you take a certain amount of pleasure in saying that? Can, can you not tell them I grin? <laughs> I could. You were being very deadpan, but you were smiling, um, which is decent. Um, well, OK, um, we've got the, the test match coming out. I mean, what, what are we expecting for, from the pitch, uh, Jared? I mean, you're going to be heading down to the Oval to, to watch this one. Um, weather forecast relatively good down in London? Yeah, it's supposed to be pretty sunny, isn't it? About 23 yeah. or 24 most days. Um, I haven't been to much cricket at the Oval this year, so I, I don't know much about how the pitch is going. But in, in general, uh, it bounces okay and it breaks up, so it should help England, really. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't know. It's a pitch, and um, they'll play on it. And uh, but I, It's much more fun to talk about pitch once we've seen the cricket on it, and then we can spend hours. Let's talk about the rollers. <laughs> Just at one point, about a couple of the journalists who were down there this morning for training noted how um, it was uncovered uh, two days out from the game on quite a warm day with a suggestion that it wasn't quite dry enough yet for England's liking. So I, I think we're going to I think we're going to see another um, another attempt to spin out Australia. I don't suspect it will fly through um, for, for, for Chris Tremlett or Stuart Broad or something like that. I think we'll have uh, Graham Swan getting a lot more overs. Uh, and maybe uh, a fair bit of bowling for Joe Root as well. And a fair bit of bowling, um, Jared, for, for Nathan Lyon, who was the, the one bowler, really, for, for the Australians, who, who had a decent match in the Lions game. Yeah, I mean, he had a decent match last test. The ball didn't really spin much, and he took seven wickets. Six or seven. Yeah. Um, I thought he played really well. He got so much abuse on Twitter. Uh, he's averaging 33, um, which for an international spinner is 
is respectable. I mean, he's not a superstar. He just keeps getting dropped. And he's not Monty Panasar, because Exactly. And, I, you know, I think there's, there's sort of this unrealistic expectation. I don't think it's just Shane Warne related anymore. I think it's if there's something else going on where everyone just says he's not good enough, he doesn't spin it enough. Is it Graham Swan related? Is Could it in com the contemporary aspect? I mean, what is Graham Swan average? 28-29. It's not, so it, it's, it's not masses different. It's just the other side of 30, isn't it? And so, I would yeah. say those four runs are the difference between the two. In that he can, he can drift the ball a little bit more, he spins it a little bit more, and he's probably a little bit more canny. But uh, Nathan Lyon really sticks in there, and he's actually he's got one thing that you don't see on TV, and you can only see it when you go square to the wicket, is he gets a lot of dip really late, far more than Swan, and far more than almost any finger spinner I've seen. He bowls quite slow, and the ball really dips, and that was how he got Indians out in Adelaide. Um, he also took seven wickets in an innings against India in India recently. He can bowl. He's okay. He's not a superstar, but I, I, I think Australia needs to think, if we've got a guy that for the next seven years can average 33 with a ball... Um, as a spinner, it's probably worth us taking a punt on him, especially with, for the first time in Australian cricket, they've got a chance of perhaps having an all-rounder in Faulkner coming through shortly, um, and some, you know, maybe someone like Alex Keith or Mitchell Marsh even coming through in the next few years. That, 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 it's changed. Australia hasn't had an all-rounder since Keith Miller, and I'm, I can't quite, you know, Shane Watson's probably never quite been the all-rounder they've wanted through injury and, you know, bad form. But if they if they do do that, what what it gives them is five frontline bowlers, and I think that actually changes everything for Australia. And if that's the case, a bowler who averages thirty three, who fights for all these wickets, is probably worth keeping. Um, but he'll be dropped soon. It, you sort of expect him to be dropped soon. But I don't, it was Michael Hussey who said uh, earlier this year that he thought that Nathan Lyon was the most important uh, member of the dressing room in the Australian team, and he was the glue that held the team together. I just wonder if you felt that there was any truth in that. Uh, well, he's a good guy, isn't he? I mean, Brad and he is, does the theme song, doesn't he? Well, he will. They ever win again? He will. He will one day. Um, <laughs> Brettig, um, Brettig loves him. Uh, Brettig's got this sort of man crush. He's just he's such a good guy. I remember when Agar made his '98. They were only all online. Hey, only online. Well, <laughs> um, he was out on the balcony, um, lying, really clapping. And Brettig's like, "See, see, I told you, what a great guy he is." Um, so he clearly is that sort of person. Um, and maybe like that sort of person, he's sort of, you know, he's the guy you date when you're looking for someone slightly better. A bit <laughs> like you. You're the guy we date until um, uh, until we get a better presenter. Until you get a, an actual presenter. Yeah. Okay, well, um, on that note, I think that's probably all we've got time for this week. Um, we will be back in a week's time to look back on events that unfold at the Oval over the, the next week. But on this occasion, thank you very much to Jared, to Nasha, and to Alex. And thank you for joining us here on the Switch It Show on ESPNCrickInfo.com.